And the Buddha taught meditation to Rahula, his son. He started out by saying, make your mind like earth. People throw disgusting things on the earth, but the earth doesn't shrink away in disgust. Make your mind like water, wind, fire. Water washes away dirty things. Wind blows dirty things around. Fire burns garbage. But none of them are disgusted by this. Now, it's important to see this as a first principle in the meditation, but not as the whole meditation. Because then the Buddha goes on to teach Ruhula many other contemplations and finally gets him to work with the breath. And in working with the breath, there's a lot of work to be done. You breathe with certain aims in mind, and you try to bring about certain mental states. So you're not just like a clod of earth, sitting there with whatever. You take this earthness of the mind that's not reactive, and you make that a foundation for doing really good work. And there are two reasons why you need to have a, a steady mind in order to affect good change. One is if you spend all your time reacting to things. This person said that person, this person thinks this, I have this feeling about that person. You just wear yourself out. I know a therapist who was working with some kids one time who were in a school for kids who had a jail record and they were going to be integrated back into regular schools. And she presented them with a series of hypothetical situations. It would be stressful, and asked them to gauge how much stress they would feel. Things ranging everything from, you know, your brother has been stabbed, to I'm going out on a date tonight and I don't have a good dress. And the kids couldn't rank them. They all pegged out at ten full stress over everything. And this she identified as one of the problems, is they couldn't monitor stress, because whatever happened that would get them upset got them totally upset, and then they ended up doing stupid things. So this is one of the reasons why you want to learn how to keep your mind in that sort of earth mode, non-reactive. You don't waste your time stressing out over things that are minor. You learn to get a sense of proportion, which things are important, which things are not. This connects with the other reason you want to make your mind steady, is so that you can see things clearly. As the Buddha said, one of the qualities he was looking for in any of his students was that the person be observant and true. Admitting that one's faults, but at the same time being able to see things that are not always pointed out to you. The Ajans make a lot of this quality. They say if you're sitting alone in the, in the forest meditating and a problem comes up and you can't figure out how to solve it, what are you going to do? You can't go running off to your teacher all the time. You have to learn how to solve your own problems. And this comes from being observant. You experiment. You try this, you try that, and you try to make your mind steady enough so it can be a good judge of what's working and what's not. So you can remember clearly what you did, and then clearly gauge what's coming up as a result. So try to develop this quality of being non-reactive. The breath helps with this, because if you have good steady breath, in the sense of healthy breath energy in the body, and the breath energy is feeling harmonious. And it feels really grounding. You're not pushed off of your center so much. And when you're not pushed off of your center, you're in a position where you can see what's up and what's down, what's left, what's right. In other words, you see more clearly what's going on, and you begin to see areas in which you're adding a lot of unnecessary complication to the situation. 
because that's mainly what we're looking for. To what extent is this stress I'm feeling in my mind right now the result of my own actions? I mean, there is a stress that comes just in the three characteristics, i.e. the fact that things change. They're inconstant, they're dependent on conditions, and anything dependent on conditions has some stress built into it. But that stress doesn't have to weigh down the mind. It's the stuff that we add that really weighs the mind down. You can't see what you're adding if you're just in the midst of adding it all the time. You have to be able to step back from one part of the mind and look at the other parts of the mind and see, what are they doing? So the breath gives you a place where you can stand. So you work with the breath. And also in working with the breath, it takes your mind off a lot of other things that it can be making itself miserable about. And you've got something you can work with and see results. You change the way you breathe, you change the way you focus on the breath, you change the way you conceive the breath energy in the body, and there'll be changes in how you experience the body here in the present moment. If there are pains in different parts of the body, or if you have an old injury, you can think about the breath energy working around them, working through them. And you begin to notice that there are patterns of tension that you built up around the pain or built up around the old injury. And as you release those, then other patterns get released as well. It's like a whole series of rubber bands. When one gets loosened, then a lot of the mother get loosened as well. So there's a lot to explore right here. And as you get more and more skilled to the breath, it gives you a greater sense of confidence. But again, to observe the breath, you have to make your mind as steady as possible, as non-reactive as possible. And then you're in a better position to see clearly what choices would be good choices to do. They have that phrase in the Zen tradition that the great way is not hard for those with no preferences. Now that doesn't mean that you don't prefer the end of suffering to suffering. You do prefer not to suffer. It's simply once you see in all fairness and all objectivity what needs to be done, then whether you like it or not, you do it. As for the things that need to be abandoned, even though you may like them, you can talk yourself into letting them go. In other words, you can't let your preferences reign. You want your powers of observation, you the steadiness of those powers of observation, to be the basis from which you make your choices. And as the mind feels steadier, it's more likely to make better choices. Now, the simple fact of concentration is not enough to guarantee that you'll be wise. Concentration can foster wisdom and discernment. In some cases, it seems to follow naturally, but in other cases you have to actively think about things, think things through, analyze them. So again, the concentration is a basis, the steadiness is a basis, but there is more work to be done on top of that. It's good work, because you think about all the many lifetimes that you've been creating suffering for yourself through not being able to observe what you're doing. through having a mind that's not like earth, water, wind, and fire, a mind that's reactive and goes by its likes and dislikes. And here's your chance to do some work, to step back from those and be a new person, not the person you used to be, not the reactive person, but a person who's steady and doesn't get blown around by things. So whatever comes up, good or bad, don't spend a lot of time and energy reacting. Just notice and realize that these things can just wash past, wash past. They don't have to sink in. We think that they sink into us, but we're the ones that actually pull them in. We feed on them. It's like somebody throwing poison on a table. That's not going to get into your stomach unless you, feed, unless you eat the poison. If it just sits there on the table, it's just there on the table. And when you don't feed on it, you don't get sick. 
The same with all the things in the world that you don't like. And the same with the things that you do like, because a lot of things that you do like may end up being poison too. They may taste good and look good on, in the beginning, but they get down into your stomach. There's a phrase in Thai, Oroi Bak Lam Bak Tong, which literally means it tastes good in your mouth, but it causes trouble in your stomach. And there's a lot of Thai food that's that way. But it's the same with a lot of things that we like in life in all areas. Years back when I was a layperson in Chiang Mai, a group of us would get together every week and go to the different markets and buy northern Thai food. And one market was good for the barbecue chicken, another market was good for the pepper sauce, another market was good for all these different Thai dishes, northern Thai dishes. We'd get together, have a picnic, everybody would get sick the next day, we'd all have diarrhea, and then the following week we'd do it again. That's the way a lot of us go through life. We just gobble down the things we like, and we say, well, I'll just put up with the fact that I'll get sick from it. But here's the Buddha saying, there are things you can feed on that you don't have to get sick. In fact, they get you strong to the point where you don't have to feed any more at all. So remember that when you're reacting strongly to something outside, or even re just reacting to little things that come across the day, it's not that they're moving in on you. You're going out feeding on them. The earth doesn't feed. Earth just notices and stays solid. And the breath energy in the body is solid. It helps give you that quality of mind that's like earth. And again, this doesn't mean that you just sit there and just take whatever comes. You, but you're in a much better position to see what really needs to be dealt with and what doesn't, which issues are important, which are not. And particularly, you get to see your own mind in action. Because there will be parts of the mind that are still not like earth and they want to react. But if you can side with the earth side of the mind, you can see those reactions for what they are. See how they're a waste of energy, see how that they muddy up your thinking, muddy up your powers of observation. So when the Buddha talks about patience and equanimity, understand what he means. You're not a cloud of <clears throat> clod of earth, but you're solid like earth. Once you make that distinction, it clears up a lot of problems. And once you follow it through, it clears, clears up even more.